Scott Gleason does a great job covering college basketball. Kind enough to join us uh, from USA Today on the uh, Boardwalk Kind of Hotline on this Wednesday. Scott, how are you doing, pal? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, good to talk to you. I mean, wh- how about this, right? Wh- what's going on with North Carolina? They always seem to get uh, their heart broken by a buzzer beater last night. Yeah. Uh, no different. Uh, that was a great game last night, by the way. It was. I mean, I think it's like, you know, for, for those who are maybe like tuning into the Olympics, you know, you come and you see this game happen with just like an awesome ending. You know, March Madness is right around the corner. So, you know, we're getting into the conference tournaments now and you really kind of can see some of the madness starting to uh, unfold already. And you saw Miami. I mean, I guess you can say if they were flirting with uh, being on the bubble, I mean, did, did that win last night kind of propel them? Maybe a potential six or seven seed. I mean, you had them locked in uh, in the field. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, uh, when you beat a team like North Carolina, both UNC and Duke are pretty locked in it as, you know, projected number two seeds. So that's a huge profile boost for, for a team like Miami that was maybe on the bubble a little bit. Um, I think they were pretty safe regardless, but this one essentially secures their bid, which basically means, you know, they could lose out and still get into the dance. So that's a huge win for them. Uh, kind of was at, at exactly the right time, too. Yeah, and that's a great point because sometimes you need those wins late in the season and maybe not rely on making that run into your conference just to get that automatic bid. Uh, how many teams do you think when it's all said and done gets in from the Big Ten? Big Ten's interesting this year because uh, I think, you know, you have two really um, Final Four candidates with both Purdue and Michigan State. And then I think Michigan is, they're really, um, you know, peaking at the right time like they usually do in March. And so I think they're a very dangerous team. But outside of those three teams, um, we could be looking at a three-bit league here. I mean, I think Ohio State is, is, is in there too. So, um, you know, probably four bids. Um, Ohio State's probably uh, right around the five line right now. Um, Nebraska is a bubble team that really has a lot of work to do. So I think the league as a whole, when you're talking about four teams in the tournament, maybe five with Nebraska, it's down. Um, but all that being said, I um, I'm really impressed with Purdue and Michigan mm-hmm. State. Those mm-hmm. teams, to me, um, probably Michigan State a little bit more because I think that they're, they've they really kind of come a long way. Um, they're both Final Four candidates, in my opinion. I think they've got the pieces to do it. So what happens to the Big Ten tournament is interesting because – which of those teams win, I think, will be hot going into the dance. Uh, we can probably have made the argument a month ago that Purdue looked like a number one seed. Um, and I know we've got two weeks, but I, just throwing it out there, just me, uh, Nova, Kansas, Virginia, I would, again, I would say uh, Xavier, that would be my yeah. top. I mean, uh, you agree with that or you see it differently? Well, it's interesting because, you know, you can look at, okay, well, the Big East has both Xavier and Nova, and Villanova usually gets the best of Xavier. But I think when you look at, um, you know, their profile, I think they have a one-seed profile. You know, if we're just doing like a blind resume test. Mm-hmm. That being said, though, when we look at the Big East tournament, um, you know, if, if Xavier were to get knocked off, um, they're pretty vulnerable. Villanova um, is pretty safe for the one-seed, but to me, Virginia is the only team that's really kind of locked in. And then Kansas, I think, is pretty safe as well to keep a, keep a one-seed just based on winning the Big 12 when – this year, that league has been uh, really, really impressive. So you got to pay attention to the two line, though. I think there are some teams that could sneak in with both Michigan State and Purdue and then North Carolina and Duke. Yeah, the twos are always interesting. I mean, first of all, it doesn't seem like there is a clear-cut definitive, and I don't want to say favorite, favorite like in years past, but you can make a case where if you're looking at a Duke, a Purdue, if you're looking at a... Uh, North Carolina, Michigan State, as you said, is those two seats. I mean, they're almost, they're pretty much, I would say, almost equal to some of these one seats. I mean, so I don't think there's that runaway team right away. I mean, do you look at it as, as one team is a prohibited favorite here? Well, I, I think Virginia, to me, um, is one of the best defensive teams that I've seen in the last five years. I mean, maybe decade. Um, that being said, it's not like Virginia's offense is anything to make you run away with. So, um I think Kansas has probably impressed me the most in in the last few weeks just because of how they've turned it on, pretty much like they always have in Big 12 conference play. And I think they're kind of peaking at the right time, but they have their vulnerabilities too. So kind of go back to what you're saying, I I don't think we really have a clear favorite because those two seats are pretty much, um, you know, kind of in the same, uh, you know, range as as the one seed. But the thing you got to remember here is that, like, if – 
uh, you know, one of these really strong one seed teams drops to the two line. Think about that year where Michigan State lost to Middle Tennessee, yep. you know, the 15 seed. Yep. 15 yep. seeds are pretty dangerous. You know, you, 16 seeds really aren't. So, it, you know, while it's one of those things where, um, you know, these teams are very similar, it's all about matchups in the tournament. And if you get a 15 seed, it's, it's you know, you never know. Yeah, you're right, because sometimes 15 seeds are almost like essentially a 12 seed. And we see those 12-5 upsets, uh, upsets as well. And you mentioned Virginia, the defense. Imagine them in a tournament game, right? I mean, they're allowing what? right around 52, 53 points a game, but they're only scoring 67, 68. So, I mean, that is <laughs> that can be one of those just nasty grinding out kind of games, especially if you're going up against a team that likes to play up-tempo. Um, what, are you, what are your overall thoughts on, on NC State? You mentioned before teams that get hot at the right time, and you look at what they're doing under a new head coach, tough conference, 29 overall, 10-6 and six in the conference, four straight, huge wins over Carolina, Duke, Clemson, and ACC. Are they a team you kind of want to – steer away from come tournament time they would be tough out yeah i mean they're scary and i think the thing that you got to look at with teams from the big 12 and the acc um is they've beaten some of the uh toughest teams in the country so they're very battle tested and nc state um you go to their profile they've beaten duke they've beaten carolina they've beaten clemson so they have these really um uh, i think eye raising wins and, and they kind of remind me of a lot of the teams that you'll sort of look at their record or you look at their IP, RPI mm-hmm. kind of first glance, and then you're like, how do they have that team? The committee really honors, I think, big-time wins. And unfortunately for some of these mid-major teams, you don't get the opportunities that NC State does, but they've capitalized. And, man, if you get them at like an 8 or 9 seed, because I think that's what they're going to eventually land at, I would be scared for that one seed because I think that, that's that's sort of the danger zone. Um, once you get into the uh, round of 32 play. Yeah, and if anything, they would probably, I mean, do you, it, where do you have them projected? Do you have them in the south or the west? North Carolina State. North Carolina State, let me pull up our bracket here real quick. No problem, take Eight your time. Feet. Yeah, I We didn't, have them in the west. Okay, the you west. have them in the so west. Like in the Los Angeles, yeah. Okay, so then I would assume then you've got Zags out there. Um, you got North Carolina. Yeah. I mean, Duke, we already know where Duke always winds up. And then if you had that number one seat, would you have Virginia or Xavier out there in the west? I'd probably have Xavier out okay. in the west. Mm. Um, so it's one of those things where, I mean, this stuff could really change. I mean, the last two weeks are so interesting because we see a lot of movement in February, you know, in terms of seating and stuff, but you know, we're seeing, like, just yesterday, based on all the results, like, Florida and Miami just shot up to, to five and six seats when they were, you know, on the bubble last week. So these last, you know, two weeks, you know, before Selection Sunday, there's going to be so much movement that we see. And sometimes that's good, but I think a lot of times we always, you know, look, every year there's always the team, whether it's the Illinois States of years ago or the Evansville or the St. Louis, whatever the team that goes 25 and six. That's always on the outside right. looking in, right? And the bubble burst. And then we see some of the teams that complain about their seedings. But sometimes it could actually be a blessing. Because if you're a 12 and you're really playing like an 8 or 9 seed, we've seen teams from the 12 seed, from the 11 seed, make that run to the Elite 8, get there to the Sweet 16. Yeah. So as you, you brought up a really good point. I mean, it is such a – it's always fluid, right? It's always fluid. I'm, I'm wondering, though, how does, how does everything shake up now as far as what's going on with that scandal in Arizona. I mean, obviously, you know, you look at this, it's ongoing. They're going to be locked in. They'll probably be a four or five team. But what was your, when when you read this and you heard about this bombshell with a bunch of these other teams as well, and then Miller, uh, the head coach, I mean, what was your first reaction? I mean, I don't want to say that I wasn't surprised, but I, I think it, it was more the timing that sort of caught me off guard because, you know, from the perspective of we knew this FBI probe was was sort of this dark cloud hovering over the sport, you know, starting in the fall. And um, it, it kind of, I don't want to say it swept under the rug, but we didn't necessarily feel it in the NCAA tournaments coming up. So you're kind of thinking about the storylines that involve, you know, just on the court basketball. Right. But this is, this is something where it, we're not just talking about a scandal that's just the NCAA and coaches and players now. This is the FBI. So, I mean... Sean Miller, the, the the whole situation that happened there, I, I mean, it's it's staggering to think, but at the same time, um, it's hard to think that if, you know, these allegations are true and everything comes out the way that, um, you know, it's been reported that he keeps his job, that he stays in coaching whatsoever. Um, but it's also sort of like, you know, it kind of sends chills to, I think, a lot of other coaches who might, you know, uh, be guilty of 
similar things here. I mean, some of these coaches who are going out and saying things right now are sort of offering, this is what needs to happen to clean up the sport. You know, you've heard Calipari talk. Well, heard listen, Coach K talk. not to cut you off. I mean, come on. You know, I mean, Calipari. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, I right. mean, do we even need to go through great coach, but do we need to go to the body of work and the resume, the off the court uh, issues as well? I mean, yeah, I mean, the hip, well, that goes in, in it toes the line with the hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. That is the uh, NCAA. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's interesting because this whole, you know, report that came out, um, you know, with Yahoo Sports, there's a lot of things where uh, in these situations with um, the agent, I mean, I think that um, in those cases, some of these coaches really were in the dark and didn't necessarily know about a lot of this kind of stuff. That being said, I think there are probably a lot of other instances where some of these coaches might be guilty. Um, not going to name any names, but, you know, it's one of those things where you kind of just look at, okay, here's what's been reported. You know, we haven't done anything wrong here, so we're going to address a statement. We're right. going to put this out and, and sort of cover our, you know, so everyone sort of knows that we're not the ones. A little um, damage control. Yep. Yep. Damage control yeah, early yeah. on. Um, again, a couple minutes with uh, Scott Gleason joining us from USA Today. He does a great job covering uh, college troops and NCAA appearing on the boardwalk on the hotline. Rich Canyon is here. Uh, a couple more on the Arizona situation. And you mentioned, and we talked about this the other day um, on the air. When you start to bring in the FBI wiretaps, and it's just all they need to do is hear one thing. Um, and I know he would actually make out better, I think, monetarily or financially if they fired him. But don't you think it, at this point, at this juncture, probably the best thing for Arizona and Miller to do is just kind of, you know, just distance themselves, walk away from each other. I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking you if you suggest that they should fire the guy. Um, I'm asking you if you think at the end of the day it's probably best for him and also the university. Well, I think what we're looking at now is that the difference between, you know, the FBI sort of coming out and saying something and, you know, like a national media outlet reporting is that it's a little bit easier to kind of put the smoke and mirrors up. If the FBI is coming out and saying, hey, we've got Sean Miller on wiretap, you know, um, I think from that standpoint, to to go off your point, yes, um, there should be a distancing effect that that comes with that. But because it's reporting, I think, you know, from – you talk to some of these coaches' lawyers – they sort of see it as this isn't sort of finalized, this isn't a done deal. Because think about it this way. You know, Sean Miller might be caught on wiretapping, but what other coaches are caught? So they're looking at a perspective of this is a whole sport type of thing that could unfold. And the FBI is essentially, in some ways, trying to, to you know, unload this thing all at the same time. So all of the several coaches being implicated. We only know now sort of just this, um, these parts that have been reported. So I think that you know, if, if we're talking about five or ten, you know, high-profile coaches, not just uh, Rick Pitino and Sean Miller's um, of the sport, then all of a sudden we're looking at something much different, um, and it's a completely different storyline. It's not just Sean Miller in Arizona anymore. It's um, these top-profile college basketball coaches. So that's the, the thing you have to consider here, the difference between reporting and then what the FBI actually sort of um, unleashes here with their investigation. Well, look, I mean, I think we both agree if – if they didn't smell or see any smoke, they're not going to do what they're doing. So there's something there. Um, it's just a question yeah. of or a matter of how much and who's involved. Let me uh, let you out on this one. You know, we, we know about scandals in college sports. I mean, you go back to the 50s and the 60s, went to St. Joe's and the LIUs and then the point shaving up in Boston and um, all those colleges. And, you know, you had the issue with uh, SMU, the Pony Express. I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, in college basketball, though, the argument is always, you know what, then just start playing the players. And I'm sure you've been asked this a thousand right. times. Yeah. It's 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 easy to say. It's kind of harder to do, though, because no matter what you do, all you're doing is it's, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Because no matter what, there's always going to be a corrupt right. agent. There's going to be a booster, an alumni, uh, a Nike, an Adidas, whomever, who are going to have their hand out or, you know, get their hand caught in the cookie jar because they're going to entice these kids. I mean, at the end of the day... With everything coming down, do you believe this changes the landscape of how we're going to start to view college sports? And do you believe that players should get some type of um, uh, compensation for for everything that you're doing, really, for the university and bringing in millions of dollars as well? Right. Well, I mean, for starters, uh, yes, I do think that that these players um, should be compensated in some form or fashion. I think it would have to be, you know, an elaborate process of, of how that happens, but um, you can't make the argument anymore that they're getting Division One scholarship because that's only a portion of what they're earning for universities and for the sport as a whole. 
I think that's one side of it, and that's sort of like a whole different, you know, uh, topic or Pandora's box. What I do want to say, though, is that, you know, in terms of how this is perceived, I mean, I think that um, the sport here, when we're talking about some of these athletes like LeBron James is just coming out and saying the, the NCAA is corrupt. I mean, this is a big issue, and there are a lot of things to fix here, but kind of going off of what you're saying, I, I, I think that, you know, there's so much more that um, there are issues with here, and you can't just necessarily <laughs> right. fix it overnight, right? I mean, right. There's, there's so many things that you kind of have to pinpoint and determine how you assess. So um, it's easy to have opinions, but it's harder to actually, you know, offer solutions here. And I think one thing that, you know, is good for the NCAA here is that they've been the bad guy for so for so long. It's like, you know, they're being called corrupt. They're being, all you know, just dissected for all these things. The FBI is basically, um, you know, taking on this huge um, investigation uh, where they're really, you know, just unearthing all these different things within the sport. And so in some ways, um, the NCAA is kind of, being able to uh, see that from that perspective. And, of course, people are going to still back on the NCAA. But now they get to, uh, you know, really kind of figure out what they're going to do next. Mm. They really kind of get to plan ahead. And so I think that it's going to be interesting um, that the FBI is now involved to see how the NCAA re- reacts to all this because it's no longer just, you know, back on the NCAA and it's the NCAA versus players and versus coaches. You've got federal prosecutors involved now. Not that, good. That, compounds everything yeah that's 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 never a good thing i don't care who you're dealing with or what you're talking about um i appreciate it. it's got great stuff pal appreciate you jumping on board uh good insight we'll definitely talk we'll break down the bracket in about another week or so uh when selection sunday comes out so i definitely want to get your thoughts on that and your final four picks and everything but appreciate you jumping on board for a couple moments yeah, it sounds good. Thanks for having right. me. I appreciate you it. it. You got it. Anytime. Scott Gleason, good stuff from USA Today on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. Really good stuff.